It's the safest place I'll be Good morning. Sadly, today we wrap up our study on the book of Acts. We're going to be at the, uh, the second half of chapter 28, which concludes all of Acts. And I want to begin uh, with just a little bit of explaining uh, something I've been talking about throughout the book of Acts, that Paul has three missionary journeys and then he goes to Rome where he is in prison for two years and then executed. Uh, and I still think that's probably the case. However, this morning I was reading through the book of Titus and I came across something that I've never really paid attention to before. And it's caused me to wonder if at the end of Acts 28, if Paul was let loose before he was imprisoned again and then executed. And I get this from uh, Titus uh, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 5. So Paul has his introduction, his greeting, and he says in verse 4, he says to Titus, my true friend in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. And then he says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So there's really no, throughout the book of Acts, we just went through all three of his missionary journeys that are recorded in Acts. And nowhere else in the Bible or uh, from our early church fathers do they talk about um, any continuation of journeys. So there's no record of a fourth missionary journey per se, unless this gives a clue uh, here in Titus that in fact, Paul went back to Crete again. We remember we looked at this last week when Paul left Caesarea on his way to Rome after he appealed to Caesar, he stopped off at Crete and then was a little bit later was shipwrecked on Malta. And then as we're gonna see today, um, he completes his journey to Italy, Italy and then to Rome. Uh, so there's no, there's no other indication that Paul had journeyed to Crete in order to do ministry other than here in Titus where he talks about how he left Titus in Crete in order to establish and appoint elders for the church. So I'm going to leave it uh, open as a possibility that Paul, and we're going to see um, here today that the way that Luke concludes Acts chapter 28, it does leave open the possibility that Paul was actually set free at some point and then later uh, imprisoned again in Rome and, uh, and then executed because of his faith. So uh, although there's no biblical record of that, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen because as we know about the Bible, um, when it gives us... Um, uh, timelines and stories of uh, historical things that happened, it's not exhaustive. It doesn't tell everything. It just tells certain things that the Lord wants us to know about. Either way, I suppose it really doesn't matter if he'd had three missionary journeys or four uh, as far as how we understand Paul and his teachings and, um, and who he was and what he was all about. So let's continue in chapter 28. Let's complete chapter 28. I'll make uh, just probably one point until we get to the last several verses, and then that's where I'll spend the rest of our time together. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you so much, as always, for your word, and we do value it very much as uh, the only truth that we know for certain. And I pray that, Father, that all of us 
are serious about our time in your word, that we study it, that we learn it, uh, that we commit as much of it to memory as possible. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that as we open your word today, Father, that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to receive your word and for it to impact our lives. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin. We left off in verse 10. Uh, they were shipwrecked on uh, the island of Malta. And at the end of three months, we pick up here. Verse 11, after three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Phygeum. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Petoli. So they landed their, his, his last uh, voyage on a ship was in Petoli. And from there he walked the, west, the rest of the way to Rome. He says, verse 14, There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, they came as far as the forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we had come to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier that guarded him. just want to say one thing here. Um, I love, as I stated last, last week, I love how we can take a biblical account and a historical account and lay them on top of one another and see uh, the truth that's in God's Word. Uh, because so many people believe that the Bible is just a bunch of made-up stories uh, and when we can disprove that factually, historically, with evidence outside of the Bible, it's helpful for not only for those people to understand that, that God's Word is His Word and it is truth, but it also grows our faith as well. He talks about um, where, where they met. They met at three taverns. We don't know a lot about, uh, about what this place was or where it may have been. Uh, it wasn't a bar, uh, but it was some type of a merchant um, store or of some type. But he talks about how they met at the form of Appius. Now Appius, there's a place uh, or a road, it's called the Appian Way. Uh, this road was built uh, to extend Rome all the way down into the southeast section of Italy. It was built in 312 BC uh, is when it started and it was extended uh, over a period of time to range approximately 400 miles from Rome all the way down. It was a military road uh, originally. But this road is still there. This is what's so amazing. And uh, I was on Google Earth this week and I was uh, able to zoom in to find the road. I didn't even know what I had found at first. I was just searching on, on uh, Google Earth and zooming in and zooming out, and I, I found the straight line that was going to Rome. And when I, as I zoomed, and it was I could tell it wasn't necessarily a road, a highway. And as I zoomed in, um, I was able to zoom all the way down to the street view. And they actually have a street view down this road all the way into Rome, where you can walk it. And there's what's so amazing is there's there's ruins everywhere on both sides of the road all the way down through Rome. It's like in, in the middle of people's front yards, uh, these ruins that are thousands of years old. And you can see them with, with clarity as you know somebody's actually taken a picture of them. And, uh, and I just thought that was amazing. So I love the fact that God's Word says where they met and it says, thus we came to Rome. He certainly walked this road into Rome and you can go and walk it today. And uh, if you just don't have the time or the money to go to Rome to walk it yourself, you can Google Earth and literally walk this road. I probably walked on Google Earth about 40 miles, I think, and just looking at all the different ruins along the way, all the way into Rome last night. So when he gets to Rome, um, they came to Rome. Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier that guarded him. Verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and uh, they had gathered. And he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. We looked at this several weeks ago. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, 
because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. So Paul is immediately meets with uh, the Jewish people there, his Jewish brothers that were there, and wanted to let them know that he had done no wrong. He's been accused of these things, but he had actually done no wrong. And they responded that no one has even come or sent letters accusing him of anything. So they wanted to know more. So verse 21, they said to him, We have heard, uh, received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers here uh, has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, talking about Christianity, the way, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Verse 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So this is where I want to spend a few minutes talking about Paul was a prisoner. He was allowed to stay at his own expense, so he rented a home. Uh, he had a guard. He, had a, he was still a prisoner. He was not a free man, but he wasn't bound in chains in a dungeon somewhere. He was... Uh, given liberty um, for two years, it says. What strikes me so deeply here is that it, it says, verse 31, this is what he did while he was a prisoner, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now, I can understand Paul being bold and preaching the gospel, but to do it without hindrance is very inspiring and challenging to me because Paul had lots of hindrances. Uh, number, I can think of three just right off the top of my head. Number one, he was hindered by his, his uh, Jewish friends and family. So he was raised a Jew. He was, he, by his own words, he was a Jew among Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was... Uh, studied under the, the wonderful teacher Gamaliel, and he was just advancing among everyone else in Judaism. And so he was a Jew, and, and at, up to this point, before he was persecuted for his faith, he was loved by the Jews. But when he became a Christian and started teaching about Jesus, he was hated. And we read chapter after chapter after chapter. Everywhere that Paul went, he was, he was beaten, he was stoned. He was drug out of the city. They thought they had killed him many times. He was flogged. He was beaten with a rod. He was persecuted everywhere he went by his own people. And so there would be definitely be hindrances uh, from his Jewish family, from his Jewish people. The second way that I see hindrances in his life were from his own Christian friends. Second Timothy was the last book the last letter written by Paul. He wrote it while he was in prison in Rome. While he wrote it, 
uh, or, or I'm sorry, when he wrote it, listen to the words that he wrote here. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, yeah, chapter 4, verse 6, I believe. Listen to what he says. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which comes with the Lord. The righteous judge will award me on on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have loved His appearing. In verse 9 it says, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Demacia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So he writes this final letter to his very dear friend Timothy. And he is telling Timothy that pretty much everyone has abandoned him. There's a few people that are doing ministry in other places, but no one, none of his Christian family has come to his defense. So I would say Paul would have certainly been hindered by his Jewish family. They've abandoned him because they feel like he's abandoned them and and their faith. He's been abandoned by his Christian family uh, under this great persecution that he endures over and over and over again. Everybody's just putting distance between themselves and Paul for whatever reason. And lastly, he is hindered, I would say, is being hindered by the Roman government themselves. At this point in history, Christians were starting to be persecuted. In fact, we read about this in Acts chapter 18. Let me read. In Acts chapter 18, we read about Priscilla and Aquila. Well, in this, um, this is what we hear. Verse 1, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recent, that uh, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. That doesn't really tell, tell us that there's any Christian persecution, but we do know from history that Suetonius uh, had, had written about this um, he was a, uh, a historian. Suetonius was a historian that wrote about um, this exact thing that we read about in Acts chapter 18. Here's what uh, Suetonius says in his uh, writings about Claudius. And he mentions the agitation by the Jews, and this is what he says, which led Claudius, who was a Roman emperor from 41 A.D. to 54 A.D. He was the emperor of Rome. And it says to expel, uh, expel them from Rome. Since the, here's what he said. Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, talking about Jesus Christ, he, the emperor Claudius, expelled them from Rome. And so from a historical perspective, uh, from Suetonius, he gives a little bit more information about what we read about in Acts. It just says in Acts 18 that Priscilla and Aquila were there at Corinth because they've been kicked out of Rome. But uh, a a Roman historian, non-Christian historian, tells us that they were expelled by Claudius. And it actually mentions Claudius in Acts 18. They were expelled by Claudius because the Jews um, 
kept bringing agitation and disturbances regarding Christ. Uh, so we know that there's persecution already going on. Uh, it doesn't say necessarily they were killing them. They were just pressing them out. But what happened after that? So in, he was emperor until A.D. 54. And then in A.D. 54, Nero became the emperor. And Nero hated the Christians. He began perse- persecuting them um, slightly. But in, in A.D. 64, 64, so 10 years into his as an emperor, he died in 68. But at, in A.D. 64, um, it's believed there was, there was rumors, there was a, Rome, uh, a fire in Rome that destroyed uh, most about 75% of Rome. So there were 14 different areas in Rome, and 10 of the 14 were destroyed. Um, four of them absolutely completely destroyed. Four of them uh, were untouched. And there was rumors swirling around right after this fire had started that Nero himself had instigated others to start it because some say because he wanted to rebuild Rome for whatever reason. This was the rumor that was going around. And so Nero, in order to get this uh, off of his back and to to deflect whether he started them or not, we don't really know. Uh, It's kind of split on that. Some historians say that he did and some historians say that uh, it was an accident, that where it started was an accident. Others say it was started by a bunch of people that were acting like they were drunk. Uh, regardless, the fire did break out, and Nero did blame the Christians. He blamed them. And after he blamed the Christians, he began persecuting them greatly. And it's incredibly disturbing um, the way in which he began to persecute them we see this from the historian uh, Tacitus. Tacitus writes in detail about what happened. He was a historian. He was born in 56, so he was about 10. He was 10 years old when the when the fire started, uh, but he became a great, uh, probably one of the greatest historians uh, from this period. Is what we we know a lot about this period in history in the Roman Empire from Tacitus. And in his own writings, this is what he says. And this is his writings. He says, Yet no human effort, no princely largeness, nor offerings to the gods could make that infamous rumor disappear that Nero had somehow ordered the fire. Therefore, in order to abolish that rumor, Nero falsely accused and executed with the most exquisite punishments those people called Christians who were infamous in their abominations. The originator of the name Christ was executed as a criminal by the procurator Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. And though repressed, this destructive superstition erupted again, not only through Judea, which was the origin of this evil, but also through the city of Rome, to which all that is horrible and shameful floods together and is celebrated. Therefore, so I love this because Tacitus did not like the Christians. He's, he was not a friend of Christians. Um, he had access to all of the libraries in Rome. So the entire history of Rome and all the writings of Rome, Tacitus, uh, as part of the uh, the government, he grew to be part of the government of Rome, had access to all. In fact, from what I understand, there were seven... Uh, libraries in Rome, and he was actually overseer of all of them. And he, that's the reason why he became such a great historian, because he had access to all the records. He writes about Jesus Christ. He writes about Jesus' crucifixion by Pontius Pilate and talks about how the, the, this movement was suppressed, but it quickly came back, which we know is absolutely what happened according to the Bible. It's absolutely what happened. He continues, Therefore, first those were seized who admitted their faith. So he persecuted the Christians. He accused the Christians. They seized as many Christians as they could. and They confessed their faith in Jesus. And then, using the information they provided, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much for the crime of burning the city, but for hatred of the human race. They... They 
taught and spread rumors that the Christians hated humans because they wouldn't practice the same uh, rituals that other non-Christians would practice. There were some horrible things that they would do. Uh, I won't even share the details. It's all a bunch of sexual things. And the Christians wouldn't participate in those things. And so they started spreading rumors that Christians hated humans uh, because of this. So he says, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much of the crime of burning the city, but for hatred of the human race. And perishing, they were additionally made into sports. Here's He gives us some details about how they were persecuted. This is what Nero did. They were killed by dogs by having the hides of beasts attached to them. Or they were nailed to crosses and set aflame. And when daylight passed away, they were used as nighttime lamps. Nero gave his own gardens for this spectacle and performed a circus game. In the habit of a charioteer mixing with the plebs or driving about the race course, even though they were clearly guilty and merited being made the most recent example of the consequences of crime, people began to pity these sufferers because they were consumed not for the public good, but on account of the fierceness of one man. This is a non-Christian historian, a Roman part of the Roman government who writes, has access to the seven libraries of Rome. In fact, is over the seven libraries of Rome. And Tacitus writes in detail about what Nero did to the Christians. This is all going on in this time of Paul. And Luke tells us that Paul boldly proclaimed the gospel while he was in prison and that he did so unhindered. And this is astounding to me that with all that was going on, being persecuted by his Jewish people, being uh, abandoned by his Christian people, and and under the influence of a government that is seeking to eliminate Christians, Luke tells us that for two years while he was in prison in Rome, that he continued to share the gospel boldly and unhindered. And this is just one of the most amazing things. We don't know what happened to Paul. Because this is how Acts 28 concludes. Again, verse 30, He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And we don't know what happened. We don't know if he was killed immediately. In fact, as far as the Bible's concerned, it doesn't even tell us that Paul was executed. We get this from our early church fathers. Eusebius, uh, as an example, uh, talks about um, that he was killed. But both he and Peter were killed after the uh, this this fire that was started in 64 and this great persecution of Christians that within that great persecution that Nero had both Paul and Peter killed in Rome. Uh, it's believed that... that Eusebius writes that Peter was killed on Vatican Hill. This is where the Vatican sits now. In fact, uh, the St. Paul's Basilica, uh, the incredible church that, that's built there in the Vatican, is, is supposed to be built on top of the burial place of Peter. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But our early church fathers write this. Eusebius um, writes this. In fact, let me read some of... Uh, the writings of Eusebius regarding Paul and even Peter about their deaths. He says, When the government of Nero was now firmly established, he began to plunge into unholy pursuits and, and armed himself even against the religion of God of the universe. To describe the greatness of his depravity does not lie within the plan of the present work, as there are many indeed that have recorded his history in most accurate narratives. Everyone may at his pleasure learn from them the coarseness of the man's extraordinary madness under the influence of which, after he had accomplished the destruction of so many myriads without any reason, he ran into such blood guiltiness that he did not spare even his nearest relatives and dearest friends, but destroyed his mother 
and his brothers and his wife with very many others of his own family as he would private and public enemies with various kinds of deaths. But with all these things, this particular in the catalog of his crimes was still wanting, that he was the first of emperors who showed himself an enemy of the divine religion. The Roman Tertullian was likewise a witness of this. He writes as follows, Examine your records. There you will find that Nero was the first that persecuted this doctrine, particularly then, then when he had subsided all the East, he exercised his cruelty against all at Rome. We glory in having such a man, the leader in our punishment. For whoever knows him can understand that nothing was condemned by Nero unless it was something of great excellence. This publicly announcing himself as the first among God's chief enemies, he was led on to the slaughter of the apostles. It is therefore recorded that Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and, like, and that Peter likewise was crucified under Nero. This account of Peter and Paul is substantiated by the fact that their names are preserved in the cemeteries of that place even to this present day. So when he was writing this letter or, or, or writing down this history, at the moment he was writing it, the graves of Peter and Paul were still there. It is confirmed likewise by Caius, a member of the church who arose under Zephyrnius, bishop of Rome. He, in a published disputation with Proculus, the leader of the Phrygian heresy, speaks as follows concerning the places where the sacred corpses of the aforesaid apostles are laid. And here's what he says. But I can show the trophies of the apostles. For if you will go to the Vatican or to the Ostian Way, you will find the trophies of those who laid the foundations of this church and that they both suffered martyrdom at the same time is stated by Dionysius, bishop of Corinth, in his epistle to the Romans in the following words, You have thus by such an admonition bound together the planting of Peter and of Paul at Rome and Corinth, for both of them planted and likewise taught us in our Corinth. And they taught together in like manner in Italy and suffered martyrdom at the same time. I've quoted these things in order that the truth of the history might still be more confirmed. So Luke leaves it open. He doesn't give us details about what happened after this period. It's possible, as I stated at the beginning, that Paul was released for a very short amount of time and did some more uh, missionary work, but he would have then been uh, imprisoned once again in Rome. And according to our early fathers, uh, he was, in fact, killed because of his faith. And he writes that, I read this a few minutes ago, but he writes in Second Timothy, which was his final work, uh, his final uh, writings. He says in verse 9, Do your best to come to me soon. I'm sorry, in verse 6, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. He knows. Paul knows. Whether, whether this was at the time where he was in prison in chapter 28 or if it was a, a year or two later, it's regardless, regardless of that. He's in prison. This is his final time in prison when he writes the book of 2 Timothy. And he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And that leads me to conclude the book of Acts with... Two final questions. The first question is, if today was your last day on earth, if you, like Paul, knew that today is your last day or your time is drawing near, could you say as boldly as Paul that you fought the good fight, that you finished your race, and that you kept the faith? Can you say that without any regret, can you say that you did the very best that you could do for the Lord, that you shared your faith with others because you were burdened by the lostness of your friends and your family and your co-workers and the person across the street and the person on the other side of the planet? Could you say that you've honored the Lord with your life to such a degree that you have fought the good fight, that you finished your race, 
and that you're at peace knowing that you did the best that you could do, that you kept your faith. That's question number one. And I do ask that you sincerely ponder that question. Question number two is, what is hindering your faith? What's hindering you from sharing Christ with your friends, your family, your co-workers, and with strangers? Paul was certainly hindered from the Jews. He was hindered from Christians, and he was hindered from the Romans, from the government itself. And yet Luke tells us that he boldly spoke about Jesus unhindered. He didn't allow these things to stop him from doing what the Lord had called him to do. So what is hindering you? What's hindering you? What's keeping you from being more bold with your faith? What, keep, what causes you to shrink back and to either be nervous, be fearful, or just not even care that you, like Paul, are called to share your faith with the world? What's hindering you? Like the first question, I do hope that you ponder that, that you think about that, that you search your heart. Because the reality is, is that one day we will stand before the Lord. And all of us, I believe, we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And we want to be able to say to the Lord, Lord, I shared your faith without hindrance. I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I didn't shrink away even when everyone was against me, even when my own family members, when my own people, when they tried to persecute me and even have me put to death, and even when the, the power of the Roman government came down, he never lost his faith. History tells us that he was beheaded because of his faith, that he never shied away, he never recanted his belief in Jesus Christ, and he never stopped telling other people that Jesus was the way to seek reconciliation for their sins. And my prayer is, as we've studied and journeyed through the book of Acts, my prayer for you and for myself included is that we become even more bold in our faith, that we don't look around and we think that we're being persecuted as Christians because we have no idea what true persecution is. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for all believers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the example of Paul. And Lord, that you wrote these things down. He's not our example. Jesus is our example. But Paul certainly is inspiring. His life was incredible. And the fact that he endured so much for the sake of the kingdom, I pray, Lord, inspires us all that we don't look around at our lives and think that we're being persecuted. We have no idea what persecution is. For almost 250 years from Nero until uh, Constantine, Lord, Christians were under a great persecution. I pray, Father, that we don't shrink away that we don't find excuses to not share our faith, but that we begin to, show, to share it more boldly and like Paul, unhindered. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.